Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us on uh, this long holiday weekend. And uh, how many of you are thankful for air conditioners this, this weekend? Amen. And uh, all that amazing weather just uh, left us, and here we are. Uh, but we celebrate this weekend uh, the birth of our American independence, and we have so much to be thankful for as believers and as Americans. I was on the border this week with some of our city serve team of El Paso and Juarez, Mexico, uh, on Thursday and Friday for an outreach that was, was happening there with local churches, uh, really reaching out to immigrant women and children who are stuck in a very difficult situation. And um, I was just reminded of how many good and compassionate people God-fearing people, people that really do care, that are standing for righteousness in America, uh, from local churches and citizens, from uh, just God-honoring community leaders, hundreds of, of Jesus-loving border agents that were there, border patrols, officers, really protecting our country, but compassionately uh, serving those that are in a very vulnerable situation. Um, this is an amazing country, and uh, sometimes, you know, because there's so much bad news, we mistakenly think that no one really cares, but it's just not true. God has people everywhere. How many of you know that? The Lord has people everywhere. And um, the enemy wants you to think that it's hopeless so that you become fatalistic, and then you give up. That's what happens when you lose hope. You give up. You quit trying. And as a community, if we lose hope, um, we'll do the same. And I think about that this weekend because, you know, I think about our founding fathers. And, you know, what if our founding fathers wouldn't have had the courage to fight for what is right, uh, the blessings that we enjoy as Americans. And while not perfect, the blessing that America has been to the world just wouldn't be. And um, as we celebrate this weekend, and uh, you gather with family and loved ones, uh, just be reminded that God's blessed us immensely. Uh, this is a time for Christians to remain hopeful. It's a time for Christians to be engaged. And uh, I hope that we are, I hope that you are among those who are engaged for the cause of Christ and for uh, you know the, the opportunity to love people to Jesus. We have an amazing opportunity right now as Christians, to love people to Jesus. And Jesus came, he laid down his life as a sacrifice for people who desperately needed uh, redemption. And he's called us to live out that life as well. We're continuing in our study, and today we're in Luke chapter 11, and we're in the series Start With Jesus, and we're in Luke 11, and so I want you to just Turn there, if you will, to Luke chapter 11. If you don't have your Bibles, you can go to the Uversion app. And um, we're going to be in Luke 11 again today. One of the things that stands out as you study the gospel is how often Jesus confronts and corrects religious people, the religious leaders of his day. You would think it wouldn't be those people that were the problem people, but in Jesus' day, it was very much the religious leaders uh, of his day that he uh, corrected, confronted, and corrected in large part because their religious practice had become just ritual. In many ways, they were just going through the motions rather than really having a heartfelt and meaningful relationship with God. It had become religious practice, and this can happen in religion. It had become ceremonial. It had become empty ritual, and sadly, it was filled with hypocrisy. And so Jesus, you know, calls them on it. In Luke 11, we see that after Jesus, as we studied week before last, the Lord's Prayer, teaches his disciples about prayer and the importance of daily conversation with the Father. We pick up in verse 14, and we'll see this. We'll see Jesus having one of these moments of confrontation 
and correction with religious leaders. Begin at verse 14, it says, and he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. But he knowing their thoughts said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Keep your Bibles open to this chapter because we're going to read on just a little bit more this morning. But in Luke 11, you notice how that the religious leaders of the day rejected Jesus. They just rejected him. Even though Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament regarding the Messiah, even though they witnessed an abundance of supernatural signs, Scripture says they still rejected him. And Luke here in chapter 11 mentions one of those signs. And it is this man who has a demonic spirit and that spirit caused him to be mute. He couldn't speak. And in this passage, Jesus cast this demon out of the man and all the people were amazed. Scripture says the multitudes marveled. Notice that in verse 14. And he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out and the mute spoke that the multitudes marveled. The people marveled. The people were amazed at this demonstration of God's power. Jesus doesn't ask this demon his name. Jesus doesn't make a big deal of it. He just, he just casts this demon out. And this man starts talking. And everyone's amazed except the religious leaders. So the religious leaders come up with, they create really a false narrative of how Jesus accomplished such a miracle. The religious leaders say, well, you did this because you're in cahoots with the devil. That's what they were saying because of their rejection of Jesus. They had to have some explanation for this demonstration of power. So they said, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan, a false narrative. This idea of you know a false narrative about the righteous or the people of God or what they intend to be and do in the world is not something new that we're seeing now in our day. It's something that has always existed even in Jesus' day. And so Jesus, you know, he speaks to the absurdity of such a statement by teaching something really important, a really important principle that is tucked away here in verse 17, and I want you to see it. He says, but he knowing their thoughts said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. A house divided against itself falls. Whether it's a kingdom that's divided against itself, whether it's a home divided against itself, what Jesus is saying and the principle that he is declaring, you know that is true in, at every level, that 
It cannot stand. It will ultimately fall. Maybe, you know, you think about our own country right now and the divisiveness in our country. We certainly feel this. But maybe in your home this morning, the strain of division is taking a toll on your home. Jesus is saying the stability of a deep and bitter divided kingdom or home is just not sustainable. Conversely, scripture says in Psalm 133 that where there's unity, God commands his blessing. Where there's, you know, a house divided against itself, a nation divided against itself, a kingdom divided against itself, it just can't stand. But where there's, where there's unity, there's blessing. It was Lincoln who quoted these words of Jesus in one of his most famous speeches. In fact, it was such a famous speech, this speech is known as the house divided speech. And he quoted this passage when he was running for US Senate and talking about the issue of slavery. And that speech was so impactful that it was published you know, in, it, in, in its entirety. The full speech was published in the papers of that day and he was declaring in this speech in Springfield, Illinois, as he was running for US Senate, the ideas of freedom and how the institution of slavery could not coexist long-term with the ideas of freedom. And though he didn't win the Senate seat at that moment in that time in that election cycle, he did go on to become the President of the United States. And that speech was very instrumental because he led our country through a very painful and bitterly divisive time. And he led us as a country back to a better place. But he used as a basis for that speech, the house divided against itself won't stand. It's important in our day to be people who speak truth. It is absolutely important to be people who declare the word of the living God. But it is also important to have a heart that speaks it in such a way as to reconcile people to God and to one another. We don't ever compromise the truth of God's word. As Christians, we know that God's word and the truth of God's word is the only hope that people have to be made free. Jesus said these words, and you shall know the truth, and it's the truth that will make you free. So truth is fundamental to freedom. Truth is fundamental to liberty. But we are to speak that truth in love with a heart that longs for reconciliation. That men and women, people everywhere, are reconciled to God. The Apostle Paul really puts it this way in Ephesians 4.15, he says, but we are to hold to the truth with love in our hearts. We are to grow up and be more like Christ. He is the leader of the church. He's saying, hold true to the truth. Hold fast to the truth, but also hold fast to the love of God. And he says to his church and to the Ephesians, you know, grow up, be more like Jesus, who is our leader in his church. We are his church, but he is the leader of his church. And he's saying, hold fast to truth for sure, but speak that truth from a heart that is filled with the love of Christ. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 5, and he speaks to this same idea. He says, now then we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. It is the heart that holds fast to truth and the heart that cares about people and wants to see them reconciled to God that brings about in a home or in our country or in a church or in our community that brings about any form of God-honoring unity. 
we need to know this about most of the forms of media in our day. That most of the forms of media in our day, they make money, social media, certainly, you know, television, uh, you know, commentators, they largely make their money by creating controversy, by creating division, by creating anger, by creating strife. We are about truth that reconciles people to God. So we need to be taking our cues, not from the media, but from our prayer closet, spending time in conversation with God, amen? amen. And this is my concern. My concern is we're taking our cues from the wrong people. That we're trying to mimic what we're watching or seeing and it is only bringing further brokenness hopelessness, despair, division in our day. When we have the opportunity not to take our cues from, from those forms, but to take our cue from God himself by being people who are having our hearts transformed, that the love of God is shed abroad, Paul writes, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That God causes us to love in such a way that we see and encounter people that we even disagree with and our hearts cry out for their salvation, for the Lord to do a mighty work in their life. Amen? Amen. So the religious leaders of that day were worried because they were worried about you know, a disruption to their religious hypocrisy, a disruption to their power base, they didn't care about this man that Jesus had just delivered and healed. They didn't care at all about him. They were just wanting to stop Jesus at any cost, so they were accusing him of casting out demons by the power of Satan, calling good evil. Certainly that happens in our day. So Jesus points out how erroneous their argument is when he says in verse 20, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is really what they were resisting. They were resisting the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God had come in the person of Jesus Christ, but he was a threat to their power base, to their own kingdom. And so they were uncomfortable with that, and Jesus is saying, that the man who stands before you, he's been delivered by the power of God. There's no argument to how this has happened. The kingdom of God is here in the person of Jesus Christ. But these religious leaders continue to stubbornly ref, you know, refuse to acknowledge the kingdom of God had come in the person of Jesus Christ. So this is what the latter part of, of Luke 11 really is about. It is about the kingdom of God has come. In Christ, the kingdom of God has come. There is a new kingdom that is in place because Jesus has come. And kings and kingdoms of this world, they will all pass away, but there's one king that will remain and one kingdom that will remain, amen? The kingdom of God has come in Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 21. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. So Jesus is making really clear here this truth, that there are two kingdoms. The kingdom of the evil one who has come to steal, kill, and destroy and the kingdom of God that has come to give life and to give life more abundantly. And Jesus is pointing to this more powerful kingdom, Satan's kingdom of bondage and destruction, Jesus is saying, can only, become, uh, can only be overcome by a stronger kingdom. He's saying this man's deliverance from an evil spirit only happened because the enemy who had him bound was confronted by a stronger kingdom. Hear this, and I want you to 
I want you to, I want you to get this, this this morning because this is so important to us. It is really important right now for all of us to possess a confidence in the stronger kingdom. It is important for you to live with confidence in the stronger kingdom. It is important for you to get up and go to work tomorrow. Are, are you off tomorrow? How many of are off tomorrow? So you got a long holiday. Okay, go to work Wednesday with a confidence in the stronger kingdom. Quit playing defense and begin to play offense. Recognize that you are a son or daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been redeemed, that you have been filled with the spirit of the living God, that you're not operating on, you know, on the defense. You're, you're walking in the confidence of a stronger kingdom. First John 4, 4 says this, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And the them he's talking about in this text is those who would be agents of the Antichrist. You know, agents of darkness, people that are part of uh, uh, the, the, the weaker kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He says, you're of God, little children. You've overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? This is why I love the power of testimony so much. When like a couple of weeks ago, Matt, you know, sat on this platform and talked about living in addiction for so much of his life. But then he encountered Jesus and his addiction and the power of that addiction was broken off of his life and God restored him and he was discipled and now he is, you know, for a decade serving the Lord and raising his family to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's a productive men, a member of our community, holding down a job, providing for his family. And I love those testimonies because the testimonies that we hear of the work of the kingdom of God, the stronger kingdom, the kingdom of God that has come in the person of Jesus Christ, when you hear testimonies about how the Lord has done a work in someone's marriage or family or their business or broken some addiction off of them or elevated them out of poverty, their very life is declaring the power of this stronger kingdom to a lost world. And Revelation said that the, the spirit of prophecy, it is that the testimony of the Lord is the spirit of prophecy, that when someone hears that testimony about a stronger kingdom displacing that weaker kingdom, when someone hears the testimony about the one who has come to save, seek and to save all who are lost, displacing, Placing that kingdom that has come to steal, kill, and destroy. When, we, when people hear the testimony of the stronger kingdom, it causes them to have faith. That person sitting out there, that person in our community that is living in addiction, that hears the testimony of a stronger kingdom, they say, well, if, if God can do it for him, he can do it for me. That person, amen, that is that is struggling to make their marriage work because the enemy has just had his way in that home and in that marriage because the enemy very much wants to destroy marriage and family because it is the foundation uh, uh, that, that God has used for our, our society. It is a strong family that brings blessing to children and their children and generations to come. It is the ultimate place for discipleship to happen. Certainly the enemy of our soul is attacking families and marriages in our day. But when somebody hears a testimony of someone whose marriage was made well and whole and is thriving because that stronger kingdom caused breakthrough to come and he displaced the work of that weaker kingdom, it's transformational. 
when somebody's elevated out of poverty, severe poverty, that they can't even function because for whatever reason, whatever reason in life, they have found themselves stuck in that place of severe poverty where they cannot seem to get ahead and they cannot seem to move forward with their life or their family and they hear the testimony of someone who's been right where they're at. But because of the goodness of the Lord and because a stronger kingdom brought breakthrough and the enemy of their soul came and and he was displaced and they found themselves beginning to grow and God caused their hands to be able to to create wealth and prosper and God caused them to be able to provide for their children and for their family. It's a testimony of that person who is struggling. If Jesus did it for them, he can do it for me. Here's my point this morning. My point is there is a more powerful kingdom than everything that you look at and you see in this world that is wrong and is dark and is broken and is bringing such hopelessness and that kingdom dwells within you if you are a child of the living God and you need to live with a conviction, hallelujah, a conviction about a stronger kingdom, amen? I love when I see people that, that have such a God confidence that they can see all the brokenness and they don't despair and they don't lose hope. Confidence in God, it'll keep you in the fight. Confidence in God and God's ability to change everything will keep you in the fight. From the earliest days of the founding of our country, There were people who had confidence that God had better for us and they stayed in the fight perfect. They weren't perfect, but there were many in our country in many ways and perfect as it was, had a confidence that God had a destiny for us and it brought glory to God. And in many ways, our country has been a blessing to the whole world. Jesus goes on verse 23. And he makes this pretty amazing statement. It's pretty clear. It's not ambiguous at all. There's not a lot of gray here. He kind of lays, you know, draws a line in the sand. And he says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. And this is Jesus' way of saying that there for you is no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. There can be no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. If you want to be a person who is living with confidence in the stronger kingdom, if you want to be a person who God is using as a change agent for good in our world today, if you want to be uh, salt and light in a dark world, there's no neutrality when it comes to Jesus. There's no situation where you can be halfway about Jesus. Some people try to play it safe in culture because Jesus is quite a polarizing figure. Some people try to play it safe. They try to play it safe even, you know, in their conversations with others about their spiritual life and what they actually believe. Some people will say things, well, I, you know, I I believe Jesus was a good man. Or I believe Jesus was a good teacher. Or I believe Jesus did a lot of good things. Listen, it doesn't work that way and that's what Jesus is saying here. You gotta make up your mind about Jesus and who Jesus is because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the, I am the door. Jesus said about himself, I am. He declared himself to be both the son of God and God the Son. You can't be a good teacher and not be God the Son if you say you are the Son of God, God the Son. Jesus declared who he was and why he had come. And he declares here 
himself to be, you know, he's saying to, to his disciples, but he's saying to all of those who were still rejecting him. He, he is saying, you know, he who's not with me is against me. There's no neutral. You have to decide, you know, who Jesus is going to be to you and in your life. And then he goes on to talk about, interestingly here, he goes on to talk about a person who chooses to try and be neutral about Jesus, to try and be neutral about the kingdom of God. Go down to verse 24. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Jesus is telling us here that demonic spirits, they want to live in a host, someone they can live in and operate through. How many of you think that there might be some demonized people out there? How many of you think this, there may be, yeah. Well, if you, if you, you know, if you're not sure, you're wondering, let me assure you, there's a lot of demonized people out there right now, right, in our world. There's a, a very dark agenda in our world. We're not naive about that. We know that that is true. And the, you know, demons bring disorder. And you know, scripture says here that this demon was cast out somehow of this man and there was order. Their life, you know, wasn't the same that, as it had been. But because this person he's referring to here, right after he talks about, you have to be clear about who Jesus is gonna be in your life to maintain and to walk in freedom. Because this person was neutral, in other words, his house was empty. His house wasn't under the rule or the lordship of a stronger kingdom. The Bible says, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty and there's freedom. So this person had been set free, had experienced some kind of breakthrough that Jesus is talking about. There was now some semblance of order in his life, but the house was empty. The stronger kingdom wasn't dwelling within him. So the demon comes back with seven other demons more wicked than himself. And it says that this man is made worse than he had ever been. And the point of this that Jesus is saying here is that when you experience any breakthrough in your life, and most people here have you're here and you've experienced some breakthrough in your life, don't back up. When you experience any breakthrough in your life and maybe you, you know, things were really in disorder, but the Lord somehow brought order and there was some level of freedom in your life, don't kick it in neutral. Don't become passive about who Jesus is and whose kingdom is operating within you. When you experience any breakthrough, let Jesus take over. That's my best advice to you. Let him come in and let him have his way in your life. Don't try to halfway serve him. Scripture talks about it would be better to be hot or cold than to be lukewarm. That there's something really disgusting about lukewarmness. There's something really sad about people that are neither in or out. There's an emptiness that causes you to be vulnerable to the attack of the enemy in your life. And Jesus says it doesn't end well for people that are living neutral about the kingdom of God and, and that rule of King Jesus in their life. There's no tr neutrality about the kingdom. I love, you know, Bob Dylan even got it, right? You're gonna serve somebody, he said, right? I mean, there's just no neutrality about the kingdom. When you truly surrender your life to Jesus, the Spirit of God comes and lives in you, and that is the greater kingdom that causes you to walk in a different way 
in relation to a world where the king of this world or the, the kingdoms of darkness are at work, you can walk with confidence that the Lord's going to give you everything you need to be all that he's called you to be in the earth. You don't have to worry about it. Just go for Jesus. Just let Jesus be Lord of everything. Just put him first. He said, if you will seek his kingdom first, if you'll put Jesus first, that he will add everything else you need to be all that he's called you to be, he will add that to your life if he's the king and Lord of your life. How many of you want Jesus to be king and Lord of your life? Amen? Amen. Verse 27. And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. She's talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And certainly Mary was blessed to be the mother of Jesus. And, and you know, I just want to say this because we have a lot of folks in our church that have come out of Catholicism. We are thankful for, you know, our, our Catholic friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. But it is a misnomer to think that we should magnify um, Mary over, you know, everything else. We are, Jesus goes on, I want you to see what Jesus said. Look at how he responds to this. He said, when she said, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed, uh, nursed you, Jesus said, but he said, verse 28, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The bigger blessing than even being the one who, you know, was the mother of Jesus. Jesus said this. The greater blessing than being the mother of Jesus, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is how important it is to be a, not a hearer only, but a hearer and a doer. Right? The world, world is full of people that sit in churches every Sunday and they hear about who we're supposed to be in our community and who we're supposed to be in the world and, and the mission that we're on. And they hear it, they even you know, maybe a, agree with it, but they don't do it. Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He's talking about being people who truly live the kingdom life. They obey the word of God. They keep the word of God. Go down to verse 29. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the son of man will be to this generation. People, the multitudes, they just wanted more miracles. They wanted to see more signs. And there was, in Jesus' ministry, no lack of miracles, no lack of the supernatural. It was an abundance. In fact, right here in front of them, a man had just been delivered from a demonic spirit. But they just wanted Jesus to do more miracles. They, in a way, they just wanted to be entertained. And Jesus said, this is going to be the sign. The sign, just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the well, the Son of Man will be three days in the belly of the earth. He was pointing to his death and resurrection as the primary sign of his kingdom. This is why we make a big deal about, you know, Good Friday and Easter. Because the sign, the primary sign of the kingdom is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 31. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed a greater than, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So the queen of the south is a reference to the queen of Sheba in the Bible. And you may remember the Queen of Sheba who heard of the wisdom of Solomon. And she traveled a great distance just to hear that wisdom. 
She was hungry for truth and for wisdom. And then he mentions the men of Nineveh who you will remember when Jonah, you know, after the three days in the belly of the well, when that well, you know, I don't know how to, vomits him up or whatever. Can you imagine what he looked like going in to preach on that Sunday? Jonah. If Jonah came up here on this platform, they'd be carrying him out. They'd be, they'd be like, he's out of here. Look at him. He's a mess. But Jonah walks in just after that to, to Nineveh and he begins to preach. And the whole city is saved. The whole city. And so what Jesus is saying here is that Sheba and the men of Nineveh will one day rise up and condemn this generation at the last day. In other words, what he's saying is, you will have no excuse for why you, why you failed to receive the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus. And Sheba and the, men of, the people of Nineveh will rise up, he's saying, to condemn this generation in the last day. In other words, you have no excuse. You have no excuse. And I want you to know this this morning, that no man will ever, or woman, or person, will ever stand before God and have an excuse for not opening their life to the kingdom of the Lord. He's making it abundantly clear who he is. There's a growing contrast between righteousness and evil. Much of what we're going through in our day and in the days of, to come are about clarity. It's becoming abundantly clear. And every man will stand before God without excuse. Without excuse. And this is what Jesus is saying. Verse 33, no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. We'll stop there, verse 33 in Luke 11 today. But Jesus is saying to all of us, to them, you know, in that day, but to all of us today, that when you light a lamp, don't cover it up. Don't put it in a secret place. Don't put your faith under a basket. Don't live as a Christian that is intimidated by, you know, cancel culture or all the craziness of, the, of this world and remain silent about who Jesus is. Speak the truth, but speak the truth with the love of God. Speak the truth. Don't put it on a basket. Don't put it in a secret place. Put it on a lampstand so that everyone can see the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter eight, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. How many of you know that this is not a time to put the light of the gospel under a basket? How many of you know that? This is not a time to be ashamed of the gospel. Jesus said in Mark 5, he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That they will see you caring. That they'll see you caring for people that are hurting or people that are broken or people that are struggling. That they'll see you caring for those who are vulnerable in our community, that they'll see you caring and they will glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I'm gonna invite a, a friend to come because I think this is a good time to highlight um, just something that I'm blessed by in our community. Jackie Sullivan, this morning, uh, Jackie, I want you to come, if you will, to the platform. Jackie Sullivan. Amen. She has, I think, she, first of all, she has served our city as the longest serving city council person in the history of our city. Isn't that amazing? 
25 plus years, right, Jackie? Thank you, Pastor. And um, man, she has been a blessing, been a blessing. She's a part of our church. She is amazing. I think everything we're talking about today, she has been over her career and her service to our city, an amazing bright light for the kingdom of heaven. And she has done it in a way that she loved everybody and she cared about people and she just spoke the truth and trusted the Lord to be her protection. And, the and Lord I called has... you a couple of times, Pastor, for your help, and you were right there. <laughs> well, thank you. Amen. And uh, wow, what a blessing. What a mark she's made on our city. But Jackie is the founder of In God We Trust America. And Jackie, I want you to tell us about In God We Trust America, the vision, and then, you know, the, the mission, and then how it came to be. It's a very special memory and a very special uh, happening. Um, <clears throat> I was elected back in 1995, and early 2001, I was in my office, my home office, uh, listening to 88.3 radio, our local Christian radio station, and I heard, uh, at that time they had hard news, top of the hour, and I heard that there was a small group back east protesting the national motto on one of the buildings. Of course, our national motto is in God we trust. I was immediately filled with determined tenacity <laughs> and protesting the national motto, <laughs> being on a building. And I, I just immediately felt the, the scripture, what some mean for evil, God will use for good. Amen. And, and I just, that, that was just strongly in me. And so I, then I went on to think, and th they are trying to take it down. Me, here in Bakersfield, one of the decision makers on our city council, I am going to work. They're trying to take it down. I'm going to work to put it up. <laughs> and I did. <clears throat> I did, uh, and I kind of immediately started thinking of the council members that uh, uh, would support the idea. Irma Carson, uh, I knew that she would support she it. You were running the numbers, Oh, huh? yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's one more vote yes than no to make something happen. So I thought, oh, my gosh, this, this is doable. So anyway, then 9-11 happened. Um, Pull back, didn't want this connected with any one event. Early 2002, um, we, I got it on the agenda in February and thinking that everybody would support it, everybody would know how one, what a wonderful idea it was. No, <laughs> I, I was amazed. Not every, you know, certainly not everybody supported the idea of displaying in God we trust in our chamber. So anyway, got it on the agenda. People were People came down from San Francisco protesting. We had protests, I mean, and I got all these telephone calls, some saying, way to go, and others saying, what are you doing? How could you? Why did you get elected to come up with such an idea? And Pastor, you called me, we had never met, and uh, I, I had been getting so many telephone calls, I was so exhausted. And I said, okay, just, just tell me, are you, do you support the idea <laughs> or you, do you not support the idea? And he said, we support you, we support you. And I said, oh, thank you, God, <laughs> thank you, God. Anyway, <laughs> Pastor, you wow. have been such a blessing. And, you have been one of my first stronger supporters and wow. your church from the very beginning. Wow. Wow. Uh, I, it's so, and so gave me such confidence Amen. and safety. Amen. Because we didn't know the our, our city attorney felt that that it was going to be legal because it was adopted by Congress back in 1956. That's what makes it legal. Yeah. Congress, can you imagine yeah. our Congress these days? Yeah. It's, on our, being, it's on our, it's on our absolutely, currency. Absolutely, absolutely. In God we trust. It's so on we, 
yes, many of our federal yes, buildings yes, and, they, and and for those people to be in office at that time to agree on something like that that has been the difference for our country and we got it passed that night six we have seven council members six to one um it was in the paper <clears throat> other cities in our around bakersfield started following our lead and it was just so so amazing and that started a movement yes and, yes and, and now two how years many, later now how many cities? two years later we incorporated nonprofit status um we have um we have over seven, 750 across the country now, Amazing. and 100 and actually 147 cities and counties in California. Amazing. So That's yes, amazing. yes, displaying. That's proudly crazy. and prominently displaying. Oh, hey, thank you. Can you put a picture up of the um, like the whole like the whole room? I saw it a picture right, somebody ago. Right, right, yeah. Oh, look at that. Isn't that awesome? Yes, that's Man, wonderful. Man, that's a great picture. Yes, it's Man, wonderful. And some of those guys need to pray more. I was just looking at some <laughs> of those guys up there. They need right. to keep praying. Anyway, and it's also and God educational. We trust. It's also right. educational. Some, you know, uh, there there was a reporter, a news reporter on the high school campuses the day it was going to be voted on. And they, sadly enough, some of the high school students were not even sure what our motto was. Wow. So the, the, the mission of In God We Trust America is to promote patriotism by encouraging elected officials to vote yes to display our congressionally proved national motto yeah. in every city and county chamber in America. The reason there's, amen, that's so good. The reason there is, um, I think, so, like people, like the generation coming up, has forgotten about our heritage as a country and our, American you know, the values history. upon which our country was founded is because as believers, we've kind of been right. silent and we've, we've just not stepped into that space where we proclaim, faithfully proclaim the truth about, you know, our history as a country. Our history and, and the founders, you know, to read and to read and appreciate our early history, Pastor, just like you mentioned. Amen. What they went through, but the right people were selected. And it, it's also a forever reminder how important it is who we elect to office. They are the decision makers. Amen. There happen to be six in favor and it happened. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. And that's so often, the, you know, we don't properly steward our influence in our community mm -hmm. and our nation. Encourage and the encourage. right people. And in that vacuum, um, you know, just awareness is lost. And there's no remembrance of who we are as a people. And no and appreciation what our what the framers went through. And and what, you know, as, as Christians... Not only we have a responsibility to to keep God in America, a responsibility. I mean, we need to take that very seriously. Be thankful that we we do live in this great country, but it came with great with great with great price, Amen. and we need to just continue to be proud of of what we have, the, our democracy. And just be thankful. Just continue to thank God for, for the big things, for the little things. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Because, and, and, you know, I have to say, somehow, nobody wondered if I was a Christian. Just somehow, they knew because, you know, I supported the right things. And, and yeah. I remember when, um, when I wanted to have a Christmas tree lighting. Yeah. Yeah. And I told our the, the director of recreation and parks, she said, yeah. well, Jackie, that's a great idea. But, of course, we can't call it a Christmas tree. Yeah. I said, that's what I'm talking about, lighting our Christmas tree. So I called the pastor, <laughs> and he came down and, and reinforced me. We were down at, at, at the, uh, at that time, Centennial Garden. And... We, so now, and they better continue. That's one of the main things I yeah, worried about yeah. when I was no longer on the city council. Yeah. If, if, if the powers to be would continue doing the things that we yeah. started doing yeah. that were, fam, you know, for the sake of our city. Yeah. 
So I love Jackie. She uh, she called the city attorney together and were, and the park people, and we all kind of met down at Centennial Plaza, and um, they were like they were good with the Christmas tree, but they were not good with. Uh, uh, hymns that talked about the birth oh, of Jesus yes. are the nativity and she just so sweetly said she didn't get mad at him she didn't lash him. she said but that's kind of what Christmas is about you know it's about it's, it's about Jesus it's, it's about Christmas the birth of Jesus and so <laughs> and we, we we went back and looked and there was good um, there was a good legal uh, precedent in our country for the Christmas you know holiday yes. being able to be celebrated for what it is it's a it's a holiday to spe- celebrate the birth of Christ right. Right. and so they were going through the song list and they liked here comes Santa Claus and <laughs> they liked uh, you know all that stuff but when it when it came to away in the manger uh, they were like can you drop away in the manger remember right, right. and uh, Jackie's like no I think we're going to do away in the manger and even have not only was it a Christmas tree lighting and all that the pastor is talking about, we even have a, a nativity scene yeah, every yeah. year. A yeah, nativity beautiful. scene. And the children love it. And, and we have said, we, I love Santa Claus. We, we welcome, we, so we have a nativity scene. That was a compromise. Evening. We have Santa Claus and Jesus. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the deal. We well, Christmas is, is both to celebrate. Amen. So. Jackie, there's, um, there's opportunity for people here today to participate in the In God We Trust uh, movement, to, to just resource, really, that's what it is, churches across, our, I mean, cities, municipalities right. across the nation that have interest because it only takes usually one city council person to have interest yes. and then they just need to be resourced with regard to how to do it. Can you can you yeah. share with how, how people could participate? Maybe somebody and, today, the Holy Spirit's talking at their heart. Pastor, I would proudly love to have Canyon Hills as my, as my lead. Yeah. You are my lead church yeah. and, and for this wonderful, um, wonderful movement. But our mission is is having in God we trust displayed in every city and county in America. Now that's a that's a long term project. So we need volunteers, and it is so exciting. You know, we um, and and being a volunteer is is getting the uh, choosing a state and maybe an area of a state, but then everything is is on Google on the computer these days. And then getting the the email address, the telephone number and email address for the cities and counties in that state. And then calling them and saying, and I, and I have a, a, a wonderful um, email letter that, that, we, that we email. And call the city clerk and say, I, I am a volunteer for In God We Trust America. And I have a wonderful letter that I would love to email to your city for you to distribute to your elected officials. Every now and then I get a little bit of an attitude, but not that often. And then I just, I, I'm just persistent and say, well, I, I need, uh, well, you can look online and, and get, get the names and email addresses. And I said, no, I, I'm set up to send one per city. And then I'm needing it to be distributed and very nice. And, and uh, so she does it. You know, that's her job, that I know that that's her job. And, and normally it's very, uh, they're very courteous and they're amazed and they're happy to do that. But that's what being a volunteer is. Awesome. And, and we've got to get the ball rolling again. Uh, I've basically been my main volunteer, uh, which is fine. Uh, now, uh, to Tina Miller is a long time um, helper of mine, and and uh, um, and and now uh, Tamara Montana and her husband and her mom, um, dear 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 friends of mine and supporters. So we need your help, and we we train, we help you get started, and when we um, you know when I talk to different people across the country, I tell them that this started in California. And uh, we have almost 150 municipalities now displaying in God We Trust. And I add 
So California is more than San Francisco and Hollywood. Yeah, amen. And it gives a chuckle, but it's true. Amen, it's true. But it's because we've elected the right people to office. Amen. And this this beautifully is nonpartisan and non-denominational. It's the national motto of the United States of America. Amen. And we need to do all we can to work to have it displayed in, yeah. in every every city and county in America. That's what In God yeah. We Trust is all about. Amen. A lot of good things come out of Bakersfield yeah. these days. That's so yeah, exciting. Absolutely. Amen. We have good uh, people, good ch churches. Amen. There are a lot of you good know, churches. You know, good churches, Amen. good congregations, Amen. and pastors that, that we trust and we have confidence in, and just the tenacity, knowing, you know, pastor and Time after time, I would be pulling out of my driveway to go to something scary, you know, a, a debate or, you know, through my campaigning. I had seven elections, and I would say, to, to encourage myself, I would say, if God be for me, who can be against me? <laughs> Amen. And, and Amen. I knew wow. that. I knew that. And that, Amen. that's what helped. <laughs> Amen. Jackie, I, I, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. I oh, love you, and I'm so proud of you. And it's I have amazing. felt that, and that's been it's very amazing. encouraging. It is amazing what God has done in our community through your leadership. Mm -hmm. Humble, servant leadership. Uh, gentle, um, loving people in our community, everyone in our community. And uh, standing kindness. for righteousness. Yeah. Kindness yeah. <laughs> goes a long way. It does. And feeling kindness and just caring and showing respect. but. Yeah. But kindness. Yeah. Romans 2 4 says that yeah. the kindness of the Lord leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. And we, we, have one, um, we have one fundraiser a year. Um, this year it's on August 11th at the Marriott. And actually, um, um, uh, Tabby, uh, Pabby, and Tamara, they're, they're relatives, they're, they're a husband and wife yes. team of authors. Um, the 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 uh, can't think of the names. Anyway, Bodie, she Taney. yeah, yep. and she was born and raised in Bakersfield, yeah, author, and they're very author. well known, and they're coming to be our special guests. So it's going to be a great night. I'm I'm sending out information, and I just for our sake, but also our special, the sake of our special guests. Yeah. I'd love to have a full house. Yeah. Nothing nicer. Yeah rewarding than, than having people participate. Yeah. And that's our fundraiser Beautiful. also. Beautiful, wow. So people can stop by the table in the lobby when they're leaving and they can find out more about that event yes. and they can find out more about um, how to serve in yes. helping this call happen me, across me. our nation. You know, it, it, it might be, catch me at not the most convenient time, but just saying, God, we trust. Oh, yes, of <laughs> course. So I, it's 24-7. You Beautiful. know, I, I'm so dedicated to Beautiful. this pastor. Amen. And it, it's been so rewarding. And, and uh, I'm, I'm just thankful. Amen. To, and Amen. we're the found. Bakersfield is the founding city. Amen. It started here in Bakersfield Amen. and continues to grow. Amen. Can you just show Jackie our appreciation? Jackie, thank you. Would you just show our appreciation? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. 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 Forever. Amen. Amen. What a what a great testimony, man, of how God can use people who just refuse to be intimidated. You can remain standing. We're going to receive communion. Would you take the bread? Take the cup, and we're going to receive communion. Before we do, I want to read one passage to you. It's Deut Joshua 1.9. This is a great passage to close on today with our theme of walking in confidence of the stronger kingdom. That we're going to walk in confidence that we're part of the stronger kingdom because Jesus is king of that kingdom. Amen? Let's read this together, Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Lift that bread. Father, we 
I just pray. I pray for my friends today. I pray that every person here will be an ambassador for Christ in our community. I pray that the glory of the Lord would be upon them, that we would not only be hearers, but doers of the word, that we would boldly live with a confidence, a God confidence, a confidence that we're part of a kingdom that will never fail. Other kingdoms may rise and fall, but the kingdom of God endures forever. And you've got us in the palm of your hand. It's not a time to be dismayed. It's not a time to be hopeless, fatalistic. It is a time to be filled with courage. To know that sometimes, even when it looks like things are just falling apart in the natural, God is on the move in ways that we can't fully see. And so, Lord, we, we pray over this bread that it would be strength, that your body that was broken would be strength for us in our physical bodies to carry out your call. So we ask you to bless this bread as we receive it now by faith in Jesus' name. We lift the cup. We thank you for your blood that was shed for our redemption, that just one drop of your blood speaks more loudly than all the failures and sins of our past. We are so thankful for the blood of Jesus. Lord, help us to be people who live like Jesus lived, who sacrifice, who lay down our lives. In Jesus' name, we receive this cup. thought it'd be good to close with this. Can we close with this? God bless America. I think it would be great to close with this together. God, God bless. God. I think it's too low. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, white by heaven. 
for you and believe with you. So church, be blessed. Know that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We bless you. Have a wonderful day. Stay cool. In Jesus' name.